choose the 5.15 p.m. slot on Sunday afternoon, which is one of the conference organizers' privileges. You get the least attractive spot. Uh, the second was we got lots and lots of feedback from WordCamp Boston attendees that very practical, hands-on advice about how to use various WordPress features was helpful. So I've gone entirely abstract and strategic. Um, so we will be talking about strategy. Strategy gets kind of a bad name. Uh, sometimes because strategic is like creative. Everybody wants to think they're creative, everybody wants to think they're strategic, and so to talk about strategy as a thing sort of sounds insulting, or sort of sounds condescending. But strategy is just a fancy way of saying, uh, you know, using limited resources to accomplish a goal. So uh, I want to hope that you'll leave today not being afraid to say that you're a strategist or that you're doing strategic work, right? So let's start with Hemingway's typewriter. Chris Brogan, who uh, many of you in the Boston area know, has this great post about Hemingway's typewriter. Links are all at the bottom. Slides will be available later. If you can't see the links, you'll be good. Uh, in which he says, no one ever asked Hemingway which pencils he used to write his book. So two issues with that statement. One is Hemingway didn't write books with pencils. He used a typewriter. It was my first comment on Chris's blog was to correct him on that. The second was, there is in fact a whole cult of people interested in what typewriter Hemingway used to write his books. It is in fact a topic of much, fasc much fascination. One of his typewriters went up for sale and there's this uh, elaborate, long description about what a rare piece of fine art it is and this is the thing on which these great works of art were composed and any other kind of typewriter is substandard and there's this sort of ghost image of Papa floating over the video as though merely by using the right typewriter one could invoke the spirit of Hemingway. Um, so, why do I talk about that? Well, Marshall McLuhan famously said, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. WordPress is an incredibly powerful tool, right? We've seen lots and lots of evidence over the last two days. 50.8 million blogs, somewhere between eight and 20% of the top sites on the web are all running WordPress. It's a powerful content management system. It's capable of high scale. Universities are using it. Uh, professional organizations in both publishing and other kinds of companies are using it. And it's getting even more powerful, right? <laughs> There's actually a 100, 150th anniversary edition Swiss Army knife that has every feature that Victoria Knox has ever put in a knife. That is not an image of this one. This is one you can actually buy on the streets in Geneva. It's like 900 uh, Swiss francs. As WordPress gets even more powerful, it's capable of doing more and more things. But the danger in that is that, and, and, and this is kind of inside baseball to the WordPress community at some level, we start to become obsessed with the tool itself and forget about the things that we're trying to use the tool to do, right? We forget about what are the, uh, what are the reasons why tools are important. And we risk becoming a tool ourselves, right? Um, your digital presence, your website, is not a project. Why is it not a project? A project has a defined beginning, middle, and end. A project has a specific space in time in which a small set of resources are allocated to accomplish a goal and then they disappear, they break apart and they go back to whatever other things they can work on. Your presence online is an ongoing, always evolving opportunity to engage with audiences in a hundred different ways, right? You need to think about sort of your presence online as simply a part of the oxygen. It's a part of your opportunity to engage with the universe, right? Um, Dave Weinberger, who uh, was our keynote at WordCamp Boston last year, or one of them, uh, gave a talk at DrupalCon last year about the morality of the internet. And he basically leveraged DM Forrester and said, the internet is all about connecting people. Only connect. That should be your motto for anybody working on the web today. That's what it's about and that's what makes the web moral. I won't go quite that far, but I will say that your digital presence is your opportunity to connect, right? It's your face to the world. So I work for a company called iSight Design and one of the things we do is the CMS Smith blog. Uh, and we published a while back the CMS pain assessment, assessment tool, right? Because CMS or content management system is a universally required and yet universally reviled uh, application, 
I've been doing consulting in the content management space for the last 15 years. I've worked with large, expensive commercial proprietary systems like Interwoven and Vignette and FileNet. And I've worked with uh, small, nascent, emerging open source tools. I've worked with midmarket.net tools. I've worked with all kinds of them. I've never met a customer who came to me and said, I love working with my content management system. Never. They're somewhere on this scale, right? The hearts, rainbows, puppies is theoretical, I would say. The, this is why we can't have nice things is usually where I meet people. Now, obviously, that's somewhat self-selecting because they're coming to us to replatform. But uh, you know, content management system is not a word you hear often with love. So I suggest we get rid of content management system and start talking about content management strategy. Right? The S is the wrong S. We're putting the system at the center when we should be putting strategy at the center. The system is just a tool. Again, I don't mean that as a criticism of WordPress. It's a fantastic tool. I love it. I run a bunch of blogs on it myself. I write plugins for it. I, I, I work on WordCamps. Uh, but it's only a tool, and we need to not forget uh, what it is that we're after. So what do I think content management strategy is? I think it's these five things mixed together. Right? So I'm going to talk about each of them uh, a little bit. You've heard some presentations about them earlier today. Uh, my friend Margo talking about content strategy earlier in this room. And I think they're all important, but I think we need to think about content management strategy as a kind of intersection of all of them, right? So I want to talk about business strategy first, right? Your mission statement, your value proposition. In a lot of cases for, uh, you know, commercial for-profit companies, it's quite clear what the business strategy is. Make more money from more people over time than it costs us to acquire those people. That's usually something like what the business statement is. In the nonprofit or organization or mission driven world, that might be more of a kind of mission statement. Uh, you know, connect the world with better ideas, improve access to water throughout the third world, whatever it is, there's some kind of mission that underlies what they're trying to do. And the key to be asking yourself is what are the audiences I'm serving? What do I hope to accomplish? Each of those audiences will accomplish, and then how am I going to get them, right? What am I trying to make happen at the end of the day? If I don't know what my strategy is for what I'm trying to make happen, there is no CMS in the world that I could choose or work with that is going to do me any good. Right? And I cannot tell you how many times I meet people at WordCamps, at meetups, who say, I, I want to build something on WordPress. And I say, to do what? And they say, oh, I don't know yet. I just want to build something on WordPress. Now, if you're doing that to hone your craft, that's great. I'm a big believer in artisans and working on their craft. And I do that all the time myself. But if, if that's your business model, then I, I think you're going to run into trouble. So this is one of my favorites. And I have to say, I stole this slide, uh, not this actual copy of the slide, but this notion of the slide uh, from Elisa Camelhart at Blogger. Um, this is the underpants gnomes from South Park. Uh, and there are good videos on it on YouTube as well. And, and the underpants gnomes have this fabulous business plan, which is phase one, collect underpants from the kids on The Simpsons. Phase three, profit. And then phase two is just a big question mark, right? How am I going to get from collecting the underpants to profit? Um, there's another great example of this, which is uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, right? The, the evil Natasha and Boris, who are, are you know, they're going to take over the world. They're going to do all this evil domination. But first, get Moose and Squirrel, right? As, and it always kind of derails them into some other thing. So think about your business strategy. First and foremost, what are you trying to accomplish? Then you also want to think about your technology strategy, right? This is an early uh, flying car, because flying cars is the one technology that everybody sort of agrees we should have but don't. Um, how are you going to leverage technology in accomplishing those business goals? Um, to some degree, this is about governance. This is about thinking about how much am I going to insource or outsource? Am I going to build a team that's going to maintain and manage and support? Or am I going to outsource that to parties with whom I have relationships? Am I going to do some mix of the two? A lot of times, the answers to many of these are mixes of the two, right? Open source, proprietary, or custom. I want to talk about that one for a minute. So am I going to use an open source platform like WordPress, or am I going to buy a content management system on the market? Um, we used to talk about buy or build, right? And custom would be the build option. Open source, I think, is a, is a legitimately different option than other of those. So there's been this meme that's been out lately, uh, free as in puppies. What's really funny is uh, I pulled this uh, image off Flickr, but my mother-in-law actually just sent us this sign the other day to put up in our house because we have little puppies. Uh, so 
There's been this meme out lately about open source is free as in puppies, right? So historically, we talked about free and open source software as free as in beer, meaning no charge, right? Or gratis, sometimes it gets called, meaning you don't have to pay money to get it. As well as free as in speech, or as I like to say, free as in freedom, since that is, after all, where freedom comes from, uh, which is to say what you're able to do with it, right? So the difference of cost versus sort of what I'm permitted to do uh, is sometimes called libre as opposed to gratis. And recently, there's been this sort of meme that no open source is free as in puppies. And I think their intent is to say, you know, it's not, it's going to take time and effort, right? And so what some of them seem to miss, though, is that that's also true of software that you buy. In the case of a content management platform, if what you're trying to do is manage your digital presence on the web, you can't just buy that. You're still going to have to care and feed. So, so I tried to create a whole elaborate extended metaphor about how commercial CMSs are like expensive inbred puppies you buy from a breeder that then get sick and, you know, I couldn't make the metaphor sustained. So we'll just say, why, why are free puppies so bad? I have two free puppies. I think they're great. Uh, so then let's talk about content strategy. So on content strategy, uh, far more eloquent speakers than I have spoken earlier today, but it's, again, thinking about, I have this mission. I have this business strategy. I have this value that I want to offer to the world. How is content helping me deliver that mission? Content I've created, content I've curated, um, you know, how is that helping me get to where I want to get to? And uh, TED is certainly not uh, some kind of uh, uh, highly original example. It's probably one you're familiar with. But here's TED has a clear mission statement, ideas worth spreading. Right? have an impact on the world by disseminating short presentations about interesting, valuable uh, ideas. Uh, and they've done just a fantastic job of making that content widely available, making it engaging, making it brief so that people can have time to consume it. Under 20 minutes fits inside the commute time of the average person in the, in the, in the first world. Uh, you know, make them shareable and embeddable on blogs so people start a conversation about them. They've done an excellent job of connecting. We have a content strategy over here and we have a mission strategy over here. In their case, you could argue they're almost virtually identical. Their content strategy is their business strategy. So engagement strategy. Uh, and get, uh, and I, uh, so if you start with sort of business strategy, technology strategy, and content strategy, I think that's sort of the classical sort of triumvirate of how I've looked at the web. More recently, I've added these other two, engagement and optimization. And the engagement strategy is the web is two-way, right? Engagement strategy is you can call it web 2.0 if you want, but it's the sort of recognition of maybe the most important thing about the internet isn't that it lets me blog incessantly about what I think is interesting, but it lets other people talk back to me, right? That it lets me interact with people, that it becomes not just about how many eyeballs can I get to stick to my sticky web pages and how I can monetize those eyeballs, but how can I really listen to audiences that I'm interested in and engage with them and learn in the process, right? So uh, this is uh, somebody using Captain Picard to get up the courage to become engaged. So uh, have the courage to engage, right? Don't treat the internet as a megaphone that you put in a room and then leave, right? Find the right ways to engage. And for different organizations, this is a challenge strategically, right? I can't tell you how many organizations come to us with a goal of engaging and we talk about all of these places in which people are going to interact, and then they say, but who's going to listen? Who's going to man that, right? Who's going to answer that email? Who's going to watch the tweets? Who's going to react? And I sort of say, I assumed you were when you said you wanted to engage, right? Um, you, you need to be willing to listen, right? Uh, you need to be willing to actually take seriously what your customers are telling you. And I use customers in the broadest sense, right? Your readers, your audiences, the people you're trying to, to get involved with. This is hopefully the only F-bomb in the presentation. Uh, now, I think in addition to an engagement strategy, you need to be thinking about an optimization strategy. It's something iSight's been increasingly involved in. We launched a business called Day2 under getreadyfordaytwo.com. That's all about optimization. And the idea is, uh, you know, we've spent most of the last uh, decade, 15 years of the web, focusing on projects that launch and getting to day one, right? And they're sort of uh, day one and all these great things are going to happen by the time we get to day one and then we'll be done. <laughs> and, you know, days two through 365 are, get ignored. So how do we think about creating a culture of optimization? How do we get to the point where we're measuring what's important and continuously improving on it? 
Instead of, uh, you know, we have to have a redesign every three years because that's what the standard says. Let's think about how we're continually improving our experience of our digital presence. One good sort of example of that, and this is from uh, Josh Porter, who's a, a, a local UX designer now at HubSpot, um, is about local optimization versus sort of creative leaps. So optimization is a great way of getting from your current to your local maxima, which makes it sound all scientific-like. In other words, how good you can get at your current design through small incremental changes and improvements. Sometimes you need something more rupturous, you need a break, you need a bigger and more significant change, which may actually lower you in relation to your local maxima, but that's okay because it creates the ground on which you can then uh, achieve, right? So the combination of incremental ongoing engagement and periodic significant change is the uh, ideal strategy. So even though I started by saying, you know, we're too focused on the platform, I wanna talk a little bit about how platforms get selected. So what generally drives platform selection? Agency preference, certainly one that I have seen. We trust our agency, we tell them we need a new website and they decide what tools they should use to build it. At some level that makes perfect sense. When I ask my mechanic to fix my car, I don't tell him what tools to use because I would have no idea. <laughs> um, technology team experience, so this is more for the in-house folks, right? We're going to build it in SharePoint because we know how to use SharePoint. We're going to build it in WordPress because we like WordPress and we know how to use it rather than because there's this strategic rationale, because it fits with our content strategy, because it has the right kind of engagement tools, because it uh, is going to allow us to continuously optimize uh, all of the things that I've just been talking about. The most likely, and, and I'll share, I was in academia before I started doing consulting, and the, the single most uh, both frightening and enheartening thing that I learned about corporate America was just how random so many of the decisions were, um, which you can use to your benefit. The more likely decision is random, right? My cousin said WordPress is only good for blogs, right? I mean, you could almost sort of start a sentence and say, WordPress is a great system as long as what you want to do is, and, and you would get back, write a blog, right? We have this kind of identity crisis about WordPress as a CMS. Another one is my last company used X and we liked it, therefore it must be the right tool for this project. Right? It's sort of like, I have a hammer, and last time I needed to hit a, hail, this, a nail, this was a good thing. So now that I need to fix a window, <laughs> let's use the hammer. This is the kind of home repair I do. Uh, another one is, the, this one is used by X, and we like their site. I don't even know what platform TED is on, but this is a sort of like, well, they said TED.com was really good. We should be on the platform they're on. That will fix our problem, right? Never mind that we don't have any videos or content. Or another is I've always wanted to do a project in X. This one is nearer and dearer to the engineer in me. This is something that uh, if you're in the right position in technical management, you can actually do that and get away with it. I don't think you should be able to do that and get away with it, but that is the reality. So when we think about the enterprise and enterprise platform selection, which is really just a way of saying people with a lot more money, uh, you know, what drives their selection? So the re request for, pro for proposals, right? So we create a long list of what we think our requirements are gonna be. We put together a bunch of feature matrices. We, we ask for a total cost of ownership or a return on investment calculation and we send it out to 10 vendors, typically blind so they're not actually allowed to talk to us or ask us any questions that might help them figure out what our strategy is, right? We'll, we'll hold them at arm's length. And uh, then at the last minute, look, squirrel. And everybody, you know, <laughs> jumps on whatever platform they really wanted to use from the beginning and they throw all the RFPs away and all of my wasted effort goes down the drain. Not that I'm bitter. So what should drive platform selection, right? Well, content management strategy, right? So how it fits with your business strategy, how it fits with your technology management strategy, how it fits with how you're dealing with content, how it fits with engagement and optimization. Does this mean WordPress is not always the right answer? I will shockingly propose yes. It does mean WordPress is not always the right answer or the complete answer. Sometimes it means it's not actually a tool problem in the first place, it's a problem in one of these other strategies, right? That is more often how things actually go wrong. Uh, but it means really thinking about that uh, context in terms of not just how can I find another cool way to use these top 10 plugins that were recommended at WordCamp Boston, but how am I actually helping my client or myself accomplish their mission, right? The other part of this is I talked about optimization. You need to think about planning for the long haul, right? 
What's your governance model? And, and people, again, if we go back to the free puppies thought for a minute, people have this notion that sort of because I use an open source platform, I'm just on my own and there's no way to get support. Nonsense. There's a hundred different ways to get support for open source software. It's actually far easier because instead of one company who's allowed legally to support you, there are hundreds, right? Uh, but you do need to think about it. Am I going to learn? Am I going to grow my own skills within my team? Am I going to rely on an outsourced team that's either local or geographically remote, and are they any good at it? But it's also your governance model, not just for how am I getting support, but all, all these other things. How am I managing content? What's my social media policy, right? How, is it acceptable for employees to be tweeting at random about whatever they're doing? And I'm not suggesting that because I want everybody to lock down and get all scared, because then they won't engage and they'll be obsolete. But they need to think about, what's the simple guideline? So at Aptaros, our guidelines were, don't do anything stupid. Here are some blog guidelines. Don't talk about client confidential projects without client's permission. Uh, you know, don't badmouth the competition. Don't hide behind a fake identity. Talk openly and, and progressively about who you are. And don't do anything stupid. Reasonable, good blog engagement guidelines, right? It served us well. So the point is, if it wasn't clear already, bad strategy trumps good execution just as poor execution can trump good strategy. You can get it wrong either way. The reason that I talk to a WordCamp audience about not becoming a tool is because we are far more likely to be execution focused. The very fact that you're at WordCamp likely means at some level you are execution focused rather than strategy focused. When I go to a content management strategy conference, I like to talk very tactically about WordPress and how you can use it and why it's the best content management system. But you need to be able to go back and forth, right? So don't be a tool. And then we will take some questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. And I'll bring the mic over and uh, we'll get some answers. I'm not going to lean over and let strangers use my lavalier mic as the previous speaker did, so <laughs> we will have to get the... the that was a little mic. creepy. <laughs> oh, one in the back there. Question about how you help uh, your clients work through those five uh, areas that you, you just identified when they're Yep. You know, in your projects? So, uh, as I mentioned, I work at iSight Design, and you can read our blog at cmsmith.com, and, and we talk a lot about uh, content management strategy and how to help people select. The long and short of it is that you gather executives together, you walk through some facilitated workshops, you interview people collectively in a large group about what they're trying to accomplish, and then also separately so that you can start to tease out um, who's lying to you and who's afraid to speak in front of their boss. And, 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 and you know, you do good, hard, traditional consulting, which involves people in rooms with whiteboards talking about priorities, ultimately. Um, sometimes that occurs in the context of an actual CMS project, by which they usually really mean a redesign and a selection of a new CMS. Um, increasingly, and I think encouragingly, it also happens in the process of purely an evaluation in which they're thinking about their digital presence broadly, and it's not driven by, we need a new CMS, right? Um, like I said earlier, the sort of symptom that tends to present itself is, we need a new CMS because everybody hates our current one. And the reality is, I tell them, everybody hates their current one. That's the nature, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, nobody likes to do the dishes, but it has to happen. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the long and short answer is you, you need to do a kind of blueprint discovery effort. For us, that can be anywhere from a sort of two-day working workshop up through a 16-week effort uh, with a large national research university with, you know, 4,000 web servers managing content for 1,200 different institutes and departments. And, you, you know, you do a lot of the work. Uh, in Margot's earlier talk, she was talking about content audits and how it's not exactly glamorous when you're down in the guts, but the outcome is necessary and useful. Well, that's the same way I feel about all of them. You, you need to, to understand and document where you're trying to go and discuss it and share it among the stakeholders until you get at least consensus. Not necessarily agreement, but you get broad enough consensus that you can move forward. Yep. And as a, a side note, while we're passing the mic, so I started life as a teacher. I, I, I uh, uh, went to BU as an undergraduate, and then I went to the University of Washington and did a PhD. And sometimes people ask me, do you miss what you learned in teaching when you went into consulting? And I say, no, because I do it every day. It's exactly the same thing when you have 
50 students in a room and you have to know that the guy in the third row from the back disagrees with what you're saying but is afraid to say it out loud. It's the same thing that you do when you have a group of executives in a room. You gotta figure out who's not fessing up to what's going on. You gotta dig for the questions that they wince before they answer. There's a story there that you need to capture. You know, it's, it's all that work. So I know the real answer to the question I'm going to ask is big and long and convoluted and nobody's really going to care. So I'm going to ask for a very short That's my favorite sentence. kind of answer. How would you make the argument or the business case that bringing in a CMS is a better option than cheap offshore labor who can program whatever you want them to program given 12 years yeah. to make that change you need tomorrow. So I think a, a couple, and, and you're right, it is a long and complex answer, but a couple of them, time is one. So you sort of hinted at that when you said given enough time 12 years later, they, so opportunity cost of time missed is certainly part of that answer. The increasing value of good customer experience and the likelihood of that offshore team of producing it, which in my experience has not been strong. Uh, typically, the most honest answer I can give is we ask the people around the table, have you done this before with an outsource team, with an offshore team in particular, and how did that work for you? And typically, what that elicits is from one by one, it was a horrendous experience and it failed miserably, and then we say, would you like to do that again? Uh, I, you know, I mean, it literally often comes down to that sort of uh, simple, simple thing. Now that's obviously a very short summary answer. There are ways in which blended sourcing can be more effective. There are things you can do to sort of minimize the impact of it. Um, onshore teams uh, doing requirements and definition up front, et cetera, et cetera. But the long and short answer of it is, have you done that before and how effective was it? How much are you willing to wait? So yes, you know, the classic uh, project management triangle, you can have it fast, cheap, or good. Which two do you want, right? Um, the, the, the model ultimately has to be what's the value of getting your customers exposed to your content. If you can't define a value of getting uh, your content uh, more appropriate, more relevant, more updated, more frequent, well then you're in a hard place already, right? Um, and the technology stuff again is kind of an afterthought at that point. Anybody else? Great. Thank you so much for coming. We don't have any closing remarks, so this is uh, the last session.